Today is December 20th, 2023, and we have a very special guest back on the show today, Dr. Joy James. Dr. James is a world-renowned scholar and activist and is the Ebenezer Fitch Professor of Humanities at Williams College. Dr. James is the, is the editor of the New Abolitionists and Imprisoned Intellectuals. Over the course of her career, Dr. James has received numerous grants, fellowships, and awards. Dr. James is also the author of, of numerous books, including in Pursuit of Revolutionary Love, Precarity, Power, C Communities, uh, Resisting State Violence, Radicalism, Gender, and Race in, in U.S. Culture, States of Confinement, Policing, Detention, and Prisons, and Seeking the Beloved Community, a Feminist Race Reader. Um, and today we'll be discussing Dr. James' most recent book, which was published in October, entitled New Bones Abolition, Captive Maternal Agency and the Afterlife of Erica Gardner. Um, I want to read a few of the countless statements of praise that New Bones Abolition has already received. Uh, first, Kalanji is quoted as saying, New Bones Abolition is a reminder that state repression is indiscriminate when it comes to gender or generation. The NYPD strangled Eric Gardner, but his daughter Erica refused to accept defeat. Thank you, Dr. Joy James, for making sure the floodlights of history will be aimed in the proper direction, end quote. Robin D.G. Kelly said that, quote, James reveals a radical tradition that could free us all, end quote. And Professor Dylan Rodriguez said that, quote, it is impossible to read more than several pages of New Bones abolition without confronting the long historical terror that saturates the present. This book is animated by the militancy of the captive maternal as a vessel of black radical care and insurgent community demystifying the liberal nonprofit hijacking of abolition, in, in quotes, while illuminating collective experiments in liberation that obliterate the most obsolete anti-black state in and beyond the United States. Joy James identifies and dismantles the, the backdoor liberalism that endorses the fraudulent radical identities, organizations, and movements, offering a framework for collective study that builds liberationist analysis in the context of an increasingly multi-layered progressive and reactionary counterinsurgency. I am grateful for this work, end quote. Um, Dr. James, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and welcome back to the show. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we're very excited to talk to the uh, talk to you about your book today. But first, I wanted to note um, when you that when you came on the show in April of 2022, um, and I wanted to note again today for our audience um, and thank you for being a major part of the inspiration for the creation of the Activist News Network. Um, specifically, in June uh, 12, 2021, the Summit on Accountability and Social Movements that you and Jared Ball organized and hosted on Black Power Media was a major inspiration for the creation of the Activist News Network. And we were inspired to create um, this show in large part to highlight the work of activists, both past and present, in an effort to support their work and connect the work that so many grassroots activists are doing locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and so thank you again for being part of the inspiration for the Activist News Network. Um, and I think your latest book carries on the, that same tradition and spirit that came out of the June 12, 2021 Summit on Accountability and Social Movements. Um, to that end, why did you decide to write this important and must read book, New Bones Abolitionist, New Bones Abolition, Captain Maternal Agency, and the Afterlife of Erica Gardner? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I think. I would step back a little bit and reference the acknowledgements, right? That yes, Kalonji Changa, Dylan Rodriguez, um, Jalisa Jackson, um, Charmaine Schwal, they've all contributed. And actually Robin Kelly, that blurb came from a, basically a book that was done years ago, Shadow Boxing. And so there are other blurbs and endorsements, right, that are in the book, the current ones for New Bones and the ones for previous work. And it would be Robin Kelly, um, Ruth Gilmore, Angela Davis, and others. So I'm saying that as a preface to say that New Bones abolition is a bit of a departure 
from the work that I've done over the last 20 years. It's much more personal and, and it has these narratives of storytelling of my encounters with various people. What I say explicitly and clearly in the beginning, it is not a biography of Erica Garner. So your question about why um, is this book subtitled with Erica Garner's name, it's because she had an amazing impact on my thinking. My thinking as an activist, as an intellectual, as an academic, you know, as a parent. And I was living in Harlem during the time that she was organizing after the NYPD killed her father, Eric Garner, on a street in Staten Island, a combination of um, chokehold and chest compression. And it was a collective effort by the NYPD. Only one person was accused of the crime, um, Daniel Pantaleo, and he was basically exonerated by a, a secret grand jury. But later he was you know, fired from the NYPD after collecting salary and raises, pay raises over years. So for me, this is a tribute book. Like, and I think, you know, I noticed that you have Cabral on your shirt. There are people that we have not met, but we've heard of their contributions. We've read their work or we've listened to audio, like Malcolm X's message to the grassroots, right? I think it was the, he did that in 1963. So the 60th anniversary, um, is it the 60th anniversary or I'm glitching the 70th anniversary, right? Of Malcolm, you know, of the speeches, right? And so what I found myself doing is watching that video clip where her father is killed by the NYPD and Ramsey Orta, a friend of Eric Garner, had taken the clip. And after that, NYPD began to hunt him down and he ended up incarcerated as well and also had rat poison in his food. So there's a cost, right, for being clear about the contradictions um, of the society, but also the, in, the boldness of predatory policing. So watching constantly what some people would call a snuff porn, which is just really a killing or a lynching, I focused a lot on the victimization and the horror and the outrage. And that would have been similar to in terms of how George Floyd died, you know, with under the knee of Derek Chauvin. But then I begin to wonder about the agency. And again, so this is what brought me to his eldest child, Erica Garner. It was the agency, it was the organizing in New York City. It was shutting down the subways. It was the die-ins on Staten Island on the sidewalk where she would lie on the sidewalk where her father died. It was um, the stopping of traffic like on highways that her creativity of not allowing grief to immobilize her, even though she was deeply pain-stricken, right? That she loved her father. But she was able to use her wherewithal, her capacity to think, to analyze her communities, to build a resistance movement. And so for me, that is the new bones. So the, the poem that opens the book is Lucille Clifton's poem on new bones. And that's about like breakage, right? and also about carnage and loss. But the, the promise is that we can build new bones and so build new infrastructures, build new movements, build new communities and strengthen and expand our families. And so she became the model for that. So when she transitioned in December, 2017, I believe four months after she gave birth to her second child, I mourned her transitioning or dying as did thousands, tens of thousands of people. But what I wanted to do was to remember her. And so this became part of the book and to remember her, not just in terms of her struggles with grief and loss, but also her agency. And I put it within the framework of the captive maternal, which I've been talking about as a concept for the last six or seven years. 
And so this is kind of how the book grew, focusing in three parts, one on the captive maternal, two on the Garner family, specifically Eric Garner and Erica Garner, and three on the need for international mobility, international organizing to deal with police predatory violence here in the United States, as well as abroad. Thank you for that background. And um, I guess a follow-up question. In your book, you discuss captive maternals. Um, for those that aren't familiar with your, your past work, can you explain what a captive maternal is and whether you identify Erica Gardner as a captive maternal? Right. So let's take the second part of the question first. I can't speak for her, but I can only share my vision that I have of her and the gifts that she left, you know, and I consider her to be an ancestor. So I would consider her to be a captive maternal. So I would never say that she was a Black feminist. I would say I'm a Black feminist and I'm also a captive maternal. So what's the distinction between the two? And that's what's taken up in chapter one. I say that Black Feminists can be captive maternals, but it's complicated. So a Black feminist can be a stance for, you know, parity with, you know, male powers or the rights that men have garnered, you know, over time, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that class and race and sexual identity also shape who has access to power and who has access to protection. So when I think of the captive maternal, I'm not talking about identity. And I'm not talking about intersectionality either. Like we have like different race, class, language, you know, birth, origin, different countries, whatever. That brings the complexity of an identity, but it doesn't tell me anything about your ideology. You could be, you know, black and you'll be a Clarence Thomas, or you could be, you know, black and queer and you can still be a reactionary, or you can be, you know, undocumented, you know, at the border, but when you finally, you know, settle in and you get papers and official, you know, and everybody actually, there shouldn't be this militarization of the border, which Texas is just pushing along with DeSantis into a war mm -hmm. scenario. But who you are by virtue of your, um, your ethnicity, by the virtue of your race, by the virtue of identity markers, that is not sufficient enough to for me to recognize you as a captive maternal. So a captive maternal is a function. It's what you do. And so the reason, one of the reasons I thought about it was again, when I was living in Harlem and watching parents hustle to get like decent school or resources for their children, it seemed like they were captive to the racism. So I'm not denying anti-Blackness, right? I understand it's really central. They were captive to the racism in New York City. They're captive to like um, the denigration of working class people, people with you know, fewer resources, obviously, than the wealthy or even the middle class. But what they constantly did was to negotiate. So I saw them move through stages, like just as we see our movements go through political stages. So the first stage of the captive maternal is just basic care. So the caretaking for your family, the caretaking for your community, get your kids into a decent school, get clean water. I think almost half of the water fountains, if I remember correctly, in New York City are tainted in some way in the public schools with lead, right? Make sure the buildings don't collapse on people, make sure there's heat, get the mold out of you know public housing. So there's a whole list of care that goes on that is exhausting that you do on top of your day job or your night job, right? That's stage one. Stage two would be protests when you realize that care is not sufficient because every time you mend something, every time you like plant something, every time you're trying to grow a community or family and protect them, there's still predatory structures. And it's not just civilian violence. It's the violence of the police. It's a violence of... Um, medical neglect, it's a violence of racism in medical care. You know, again, there have been a number of narratives of how Black women face certain, you know, risk in terms of giving birth that are shaped by, a, you know, kind of an apartheid medical system, right? So the protests happen oftenly on an individual level. I'm going to go to the principal and complain about these books are not, you know, useful or there's not enough bilingual translation in the school or the food is bad 
or there's mold in the classroom, there's not enough heat, et cetera, et cetera. The individual protests don't tend to work. So we move to a collective endeavor and that's movement stage three. And we, you know, we could see it most stunningly, you know, 2020 with George Floyd, you know, which the largest outpouring, right, of public protests globally. And we're seeing it again in terms of the violence against Palestinians, which, you know, most reputable and ethical people will identify it as ethnic cleansing and genocide. But the movement making stage three and the protests that move into collective, right, petitioning, chants, shutting down, you know, roads or bridges, that's not sufficient enough. So we have to think collectively independent from state thought or state dictates. And this is where I see the fourth stage of marinage, is where we understand ourselves as a collective that cannot rely on reforms because reforms have not delivered. Reforms have not stopped the US from vetoing, right, in the UN, any attempt to make a ceasefire legitimate and to have it hold so that people not only not be bombed, but they not be starved. And this, you know, we, and we're talking a lot about Palestine, but we could talk about the Congo, we could talk about Africa on the continent, we could, you know, we could go around the globe, right? And so the thing with the marinage, that fourth step, which most people I don't think transition to it, is that you're really relying on your community and on each other and your autonomous zones. I'm sure I'm not using that phrase in the technically correct way, but this is a way I'm phrasing the captive maternal, that we figure out how to think collectively, work politically collectively, how we share you know, resources, food, housing, clothing, education, right? But my assertion is there's another stage, which is war resistance. And I use Attica as an example, and I'll close with Attica. So the state in my mind, and also in my experience with it, prohibits autonomous political thinking that moves towards a revolutionary or radical transformation, right? So I wanna use Attica and then I'll close with these five stages. In Attica, the people who are housed there in the prison in upstate New York, they may not all have identified as men, but they were classified as such in the male prison, right? But they were also the trustees. They're the ones who cleaned the prison. They're the ones who tended the gardens. They're the ones who helped bring the food. These are all like domestic, quote, domestic, domestic types of labor, right, that are generally feminized. Like women do the cleaning and the cooking and the shopping and take care of the, you know, medically vulnerable and the ill, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the people who were held captive who were doing that labor. And that stabilized the prison itself. And for me, this is the long lineage of enslavement, like the 13th Amendment does reproduce slavery inside of prisons, right? Duly convicted of crime, slavery is legal in the United States. And it doesn't mean that you were actually committed a crime, or even if you did that, you should be inside, but slavery is part of the template. So this historical legacy of captive labor is what we as people of African descent know intimately through generations, through epigenetics, through narratives, right? So the captive maternal I identify with as a black formation. So inside Attica, what happens, they move from the caretakers like hustling to keep everybody safe, fed, and also there's conflicts and there's predatory violence, right? But the point is to provide care even in a predatory zone. So then they decide, this is 1971, September, after the death or the killing of George Jackson in prison on the other side of the continent, right, in California. Then it's decided that there's a protest. So you write your petitions. This is what we do. We've been signing petitions around Gaza, right? You write the petitions. You vocally state what your ethics are. Don't call me boy. Don't call me the N word. Don't like make me work for 27 cents an hour. I'm human. I should have dignity, et cetera. So you do the petition and a protest. 
and you follow the rules to do the petition and there's still no substantial reforms or changes, right? Then there's a decision to move towards movement. And there's a catalyst of a small group that likely, you know, started this. So Ori, um, Ori Sami Burton's book, Tip of the Spear on Attica is the best book to go to right now to get the details, which I, you know, don't have to deliver to you in the moment, but please read that book. So you move to a takeover of the prison and what do they do? This is the fourth stage. They create a marinage camp. They create a maroon camp inside the fortress wall. They organize, they create um, who's the, gonna be on the media team, who's gonna provide the food, who's gonna do the waste removal system, who's gonna provide security. So they create within their own formation on an autonomous collective demanding human rights, civil rights, within a predatory fortress. And how does the state respond to it? It brings in surplus weaponry from Vietnam. It gives it to the National Guard and they shoot through the white guard hostages, if you are held, to kill them in order to eliminate the black and brown and white rebels who created the quote uprising which was really a demand for human rights. So the violence that the state can levy against autonomous zones or autonomous collectives, right? That is the violence that we need to confront. But most of us are never near those zones in terms of material reality. We just have proximity. So this is, I think, for me, is why the book had to be in three parts. The first part is just to talk about here are these experiences, stories about, you know, abolition on the streets or abolition in the academy. Here's the contribution, part two, of Erica Garner and her analyses from being on, you know, talking with Don Lemon on like, you know, liberal platforms to moving increasingly to radical thinking and articulation and demands and that stunning political ad she did for Bernie Sanders. Um, to the last zone, which is that this is an international struggle. And so captive maternals are in every site around the globe. And marinage is in every site around the globe in terms of moving from care to resistance. And it, it must be collective because our opponent or the predatory state is absolutely formidable. And so it's through our collective thinking, our collective shifting of our energies and our commitments from the personal care to the political care that moves from the liberal zone to the radical zones that offers us the opportunities to win some space, some safety amidst all of these wars. Thank you for that background. And if you had to fit Erica Garner into one of the stages, um, mm. where would you fit her? Yeah. And again, I'm like trying not to put her in a slot, right? Because I want to be respectful. Again, it's not a biography. She has a section in the book because she inspired me and her death, even though I never met her, I traumatized a number of people or they felt it deeply. And that would include me. I would see that she went through those stages. Like the early stage would be, she's a quote, private citizen, like raising her seven-year-old daughter and, you know, interacting with family and friends. And then somehow her father becomes this visual, you know, of a horrific public lynching done by people that we pay for their labor with our taxes. So we're actually paying for, we're paying for the police who kill civilians, right? Who don't have weapons, who are not a threat. And th this was under the guise of he was selling cigarettes. Other neighbors is no, he was breaking up a fight. But whatever, si selling cigarettes, breaking up a fight, you like, you don't choke somebody out on like a sidewalk. So the first zone of care is about family. You know, she is named after her father, Erica is named after Eric Garner. That's his namesake, right? And so once the trauma 
of loss from family. And I talk about the book of like other impacted families that I've seen or worked with, or is at the DNC and saw the mothers of the movement come on stage, like campaigning for Hillary Clinton. And these are mothers who are high profile who've lost their children to white vigilantes or white police violence, right? Predatory violence. Um, she moves from that zone of anonymity of a caretaker to the zone of the protester. So that's what, you know, they're shutting down the bridges, shutting down the streets, shutting down the subways, right? Doing the die-ins. And as she's going through this process, the media kind of turns her into a spectacle and like, come on our, you know, we want to do an interview with you or come on our platform. And in the early months, the way we've collected her, you know, her speeches and studied them, when I say we, I'm talking about also um, some of my students who worked with me on the project. We have an Emeka um, link to a QR code that has 11,000 tweets of hers that we preserved, right? So you could see her language change. Like first she's trying to say the right thing about liberalism and, you know, integration. Why can't we all get along? And it's kind of in the template of Rodney King, you know, discourse, right? But increasingly as she's petitioning for justice and is denied justice, the family is, right? She's departing from the protest of the, of civil society, what I've called before, if other people called it, non-reformist reforms requests or demands, right? Because it's not working. And so at some point she starts to call out Mayor de Blasio, Governor Cuomo, and even President Obama, when she feels that her narrative and her trauma and her family's trauma and the trauma of other people like Freddie Gray is killed, right, in Baltimore, the so-called rough ride, severed spine in a police van in 2015. There's just this horrific deaths. Like in 2014, when Eric Garner dies at the hands of the police, it's the same year that Michael Brown dies in Ferguson at the hands of the police. And the same year that 12-year-old Tamir Rice dies in Ohio at the hands of the police. So everybody is traumatized, right? And so the caretaking is still functioning, but it it is added with the protest and the protest be part, it becomes part of how we care for each other. We have to say, you know, what has happened. We have to articulate the reality because the police won't because they're of, you know, immunity and, you know, cover-ups, et cetera, et cetera. And so by the time she gets to the movement on the streets, her language has changed. Her willingness to compromise has changed, like with a kind of liberal status. Her um, faith in, you know, the executive branch, whether it's going to be the mayor or the governor or the president, that faith is shattered because the rhetoric is what dominates. Oh, we care too. Like we're caretakers too. Oh, this is horrific. Well, then change, you know, the way in which predatory policing is protected, but all three heads, you know, of city, of state, of nation refuse fundamental structural change. And so that is where I see her moving towards, right, this marinage, which is her collective. And this is when, you know, there's a part in the book when there's an interview, like we, we did not, I did not approach the family Again, it's not a biography. I'm writing only as a political theorist, right? So I only worked with the data that was already present and out there. So I'm seeing her transition to much more of a radical warrior stance. And warrior doesn't have to mean physical violence. It's just that intellectually, she began to recognize the layers of betrayals. Now the film, not the film, what looks like film for me because it's, it was quite stunning, but the political ad that she did for Bernie Sanders was one of the most striking political ads in a presidential campaign. This is 2016, right? When he probably married Hillary Clinton. That It was so stunning that I ended up watching that over and over again to the extent that it overrode in my memory and in my emotional bank, 
the the murder of her father. Not overrode it in the sense that it eclipsed it, but that depressing spectacle of a lynching was replaced by this image of this young mother, like in her 20s, who's talking to her seven-year-old daughter in their apartment about Rosa Parks and about what it means to be an activist. And I think this catalyst of death is what mobilizes us to transform ourselves. And so she becomes one of the most significant people, you know, in my awareness to move from one stage to another stage, right? Moving towards a freedom march that would confront the lies, the duplicity, and the way in which the state and some corporations try to purchase black resistance and you know multiracial resistance because the people who turned out on the streets were not just black people obviously and this is why maranage like maranage was diverse in attica and maranage was diverse in the streets of new york city thank you for that background and i think this next question might be sort of repetitive because you've mm -hmm. gotten to it but i think it's such an integral part of the book i hope it's okay that i ask sort of a repetitive question, but in your book, you address the state's tactic of co-opting and de-radicalizing movements and not just movements, but also the budding leaders of movements. And in the context of Erica Gardner, you write on page 100, quote, as powerful state aligned networks found it increasingly difficult to co-opt or corrupt her into a conventional caretaker role or a hustle in which victimization was a sim sim symbolic register for virtue and valor, Garner became more sophisticated about man manipulation, end quote. Um, I know you've sort of discussed this, but can you um, say more what you meant by this quote? Yeah, I would you know, suggest people might go online and, and look at that ad again for Sanders. And I understand people are disappointed with Sanders currently, you know, in terms of his stance on the international warfare, predatory warfare and genocide. But if you go back and you look at that ad, she was the one that reached out to Sanders to do the ad. So in this way, she's not co-opted. You know, I believe she tweeted him. It's like we have the data in the book, right? But it was her idea because of what he was saying about police violence against black and brown communities, right? And he actually had the strongest stance, like if you harm or kill like an unarmed civilian, you know, then the police officer has to be arrested. Like they have to be held accountable. And that was the strongest stance than I remember of anybody else who was running at the time. I mean, they remember Sanders around the 1%, like billionaires are taking, you know, consolidated power or, um, you know, the critiques of Wall Street, um, the 15 hour wage, you know, as a basic minimum wage, um, forgiveness of student debt, like all these good things were listed, but he also spoke about police brutality in a way that spoke to her. So, so she tweeted out to him and like, I want to do a political ad for you. And, you know, for someone, again, who's not like an intern in Congress or, you know, I majored in poli sci, like all that professionalized, you know, buffing stuff, you know, for careerism, she just came from her heart like, okay, I can help you. And she did. The ad, the ad is, is absolutely amazing, right? It was so powerful that Harvey Weinstein, obviously this is before he was disgraced and I guess he's incarcerated now, reached out based on my research to um, Hillary Clinton's campaign and at, offered to do a counter ad. So she had power and, uh, and it was a tragedy of her father being killed, murdered by the way, maybe people use whatever verb you want. Um, that mobilized her, a painful mobilization, right? To create like a message and a story that really radiated across the nation. And that's a transformation. 
And I can't, again, speak for her and I'm not trying to speak for her. I'm just reading it within the like stages, like almost like a cocoon or maturation. Like you start out on one level and the suffering is horrific emotionally, right? Psychologically, there's depression, there's everything going on. But if you can continue with the struggle, you will mutate, right? You will emerge from your cocoon and you will be able to move on to another way of being in life and to make contributions that we need to have collectively, but also individually. So I don't, not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think a good follow-up to that is that you write on page 215 that we, uh, quote, need to define our realities before creating new ones because the political mm -hmm. language we have been taught in institutions is treacherous and can be co-opted and used to launder and cipher violence. This process of confused and ineffectual discourse is not accidental. The incompleteness and vagueness of liberatory language is not unintentional. Um, what did you mean by this? Um, and how does Amir Kar Cabral, um, as you explain in the book, offer some instruction? Right. So. What I meant by that is that, I mean, if we look at media, we know when they're selling us stuff, right? Even if we really like the ad, oh, that was a really cool ad. So maybe I'll buy it, right? Um, in some ways, I was for a moment, I was thinking about um, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman, like manufacturing consent. And that's where we think of what the state does to us. So, but I want to pose a question. What's the possibility that's, that's also what progressivism does to us? Like there's a promissory note. Like, I think I've mentioned the phrase non-reformance reforms. It's been really popular for a number of years. It's becoming more problematic because of the graphic, horrific visuals of war. And again, we can focus on Palestine as you should, but you know, don't forget the Congo and other places around this, the globe including, you know, the war in Ukraine, which is devastating and, and likely, based on what I've seen, not even winnable. So if you're continuously promised that you will be winning, either in war, like what does it mean to win a war after you devastate Gaza and you force a mass exit? That's not a win. There's always a blowback, right? What does it mean to win a war? In like the way in which the state promises you, like we've got this, we can handle it. We'll bring it to a clean conclusion. Unfortunate, we're gonna have to like struggle and suffer a little bit or somebody is, maybe not us, but we've got this. We promise you we're gonna deliver. There's a way in which I believe that certain intellectual platforms, certain academic platforms make the same promise, promises. So it's like a promissory note. If you just follow our language, right? And it's not even like follow our organizing on the ground because people organizing on the ground, I think, or because they're on the ground are more realistic about what the costs are in terms of struggle, survival, and resistance. So being an academic for decades, I can only speak about my industry. We're at, at the elite levels, we're told that we are experts. It's, you know, I mean, being an expert about Shakespeare is not the same thing as being expert about, you know, imperial state violence. But we can use the platform to sort of have a credibility that makes us seem like the intellectual leaders. And that becomes bifurcation. Like then the people on the ground, they're not, or the people who are incarcerated, they're not intellectual peers. Of course, it's not just that they're the peers. They're also, they have the experiential knowledge of being in those zones. So they can tell you what it's like in terms of material reality. And I strongly believe that we have to build our theories based on material reality not on what we study in the media or what we read in a text or a book or what we teach in our classrooms. 
And so for me, epistemology, you know, knowledge does have multiple parts, just like the captive maternal. So from what I, like in grad school, they talk about Lonergan, um, this philosopher theologian, like in Canada, there's experience, there's reflection and judgment. But then I add Ida B. Wells. Now there's a fourth component, probably more. There's, there is action. And so for me, that's what Erica Garner embodied action, just like Ida B. Wells embodied action. Ida B. Wells says in their memoir, in their autobiography, that before the father of their two-year-old goddaughter, Maureen, was lynched, she actually believed the myth of the Black rapist because that was the propaganda. Just like we believe certain myths coming from the state, you know, the reactionaries buy into the reactionary myths and sometimes progressives buy into promissory myths. Like we can deliver this, we can contain the fascists. We're not fascists ourselves as a state. You know, like that, all that has to be deciphered, right? And broken down. But it's the engagement with material reality that taught Ida B. Wells to become a militant anti-lynching crusader. It also, she, you know, they were trying to kill her, so she had to flee the South from Memphis and went to Chicago. But that shaped her writing as a journalist, right? Southern horror, that pamphlet that Black women collected money for in 1892. And Erica Gardner didn't write a text, didn't leave a book, didn't leave like, you know, she, there was clips of her being interviewed and that's what we studied, right? But she did leave a script not like a movie script or theory, you know, or self-help script or anything like that, but a script of how you can mutate through love and fidelity and fierce resistance to violence and evolve, not just individually, but collectively as a people. And those are the new bones. Like they break our bones. They smash our structures. Like they you know, decimate, I mean, political prisoners. They were, for me, captive maternals. They had breakfast programs, the Panthers did, and they also had security. And they also framed by the FBI and sometimes they were assassinated. Like Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, you know, December 4, 1969 in Chicago. So this is what we face, the reality of violence delivered by the state and gaslighting delivered by the state. What I find increasingly difficult and problematic is when certain sectors of academia or certain sectors of intellectuals promote the discourse of the state. You know, non-reformist reforms. I mean, like, th that's an oxymoron. No, it's not. It's a real thing. And then now with all these wars going on, it's like, we've always said we're against war. It's like, wait, you weren't talking about war. Like you can't enter a discourse late and, and claim authority, all right? Like I don't claim authority to anything. I'm just saying I meditate on the captive maternal. I look at my life in struggle. I look at struggles around me from my friends, mostly black women, like with their kids, with their elders transitioning, with healthcare, with violence, with, you know, all these things, right? And then I see how we move. And then I see it's, it's, it's not unique to the individual. It's actually stamped on the collective. Does it mutate in ways? Yeah, if you've got a ton of money or you're multimillionaire or all that money reined in and then now you're a new millionaire, like new rich. Um, if you follow the script of the state and it looks better when Obama's president rather than Biden is president, but it's still the same script, right? And so what I'm, I'm thinking that for me, what the new bones is about, it's an abolition that could talk about our cracks, our fissures, our brokenness, and not mask that we have the answers to everything just because we're in a certain sector. There's a humility, I hope, that is in new bones abolition, even though I was really angry when I was writing it. I hope there's a humility that recognizes you know, I, I use the term agape a lot, that our communal love for each other, which is what I hear and what I 
think about when I read Cabral that our collective love for each other has to manifest, but it has to manifest not just through an emotional intelligence and connections and going to meetings or writing things collectively or interviews or something like that. It has to manifest on the ground with material struggle because that's what, that's what Cabral was advocating. Return to the source. The source is the people on the ground. Erica Garner was part of the source. The Academy is not the source. Don't, I mean, that's your day job. Just like you collect your money, keep your health insurance, you, you're going to need it, right? The source is the people who generate the resistance because they love so deeply and they're so outraged at the betrayal and the brutality. And that's where I see them. I'm not trying to, you know deify anybody. I wouldn't deify any academic. I won't deify, you know, people currently organizing. But I would say that the people who are political prisoners, Kamal Siddiqui, Leonard Peltier, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Jalil Alamin, I mean, there's more, I'm going to forget people, right? The Pendleton too, that they risked everything to bring us closer to freedom and so they are examples of Maranaj, but in the belly of the bees, in the, you know, the, the recesses of captivity. And since we're linked to them, as we're linked to people who transition, such as Erica Garner, and that's why I spent a year trying to figure out how to even put this jigsaw puzzle of a book together, we have to be faithful. And to be faithful also means to be humble, but it also means to be fierce. And that's what I see in her. She left a seven-year-old and a four-month-old who were loved and, you know, raised by the family. But she should have, she should have, we should have created an environment, a support where she could stay. And she's just one of millions. And so that's just kind of a see what, the abolition would be that I would be faithful to. A recognition that material reality is the core, but love is, is really the structure that would keep us knitted together. So at the end, I talk about um, aspen trees. And I sort of close by saying, um, you know, the aspens, they have one root. I mean, when you're on the surface, just like individual trees, but they have this one root that's connecting them all. That we can burrow down, as we have all done, and the political prisoners stunningly have done this, right, to some degree, for us who are on the outside, for them who are in the inside, or who've been allowed to come out decades later, that we can go from the surface of politics, which is epicenter, to the core of politics, which is the hypocenter. And in one early chapter on feminism, I talk about bell hooks on the surface. She's made some important contributions, but Asada's contributions were revolutionary and were only seen through the collective lens of war resistance. And so this for me is, Maybe this book was a, it, an exercise in, in, in rage and humility. And, and I think I'm grateful, you know, the publisher's common notions, you know, we were like going back and forth. How do you even write a book like this? I don't know, because I never did it before. But it, I'm grateful that it, it, it allows me to detach from the academy. Like I'll always do my job, but I have no expectations anymore that that is a zone of intellectual productivity for material struggle. And I learned that from studying Erica Garner. Thank you for that back. There's, I mean, there's so many um, follow-up questions I wanted to ask and I'm trying to, um, you know, I want to be respectful of time and I want to think of probably the next question because I, I did want to talk to you about the, the one of the things that you do that I just I don't think many others do are, are connecting, um, 
you know, the, the war and violence and terror of the prison industrial complex, the family policing system, the various governmental agencies um, that police are at war with so-called immigrants, and also the violence that US imperialism enacts um, internationally. Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge that in February, 2023, um, you moderated, you organized and moderated a roundtable discussion with Joyce Vermillion, Samaria Rice, um, Amanda Wallace, Dawn Wooten, entitled Freedom, mm -hmm. Family Freedom and Security. Um, and this also is mentioned in your book. I don't know that we can get to a question today, but I did want to acknowledge that because I think it's incredibly important. Looks like you want to say something. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for bringing that up. You know, so we were, um, we did a roundtable on, on family and freedom. So that, that first stage of care. But you can't care for your children as the state keeps taking your kids, right? Either you know through poisoned water or hyper policing or child removal, right? And so Don Wooten is the um, whistleblower of the womb collector, this doctor who was forcing women into hysterectomies, which you know that's eugenics straight up, right? Samaria Rice, the mother of Tamir Rice, who was killed by police officer Timothy Lowman, who raced, you know, their race, their car raced onto a pavilion, and then the child is sitting, the 12-year-old at the pavilion, maybe he was playing with a plastic toy gun before or not, but they immediately shoot in seconds. And then when his, I believe when his teenage sister ran out from the recreation center to try to help him, they tackle her, shackle her, and put her in the back of the squad car, and they don't render aid so the child bleeds out right um and wallace you know has organized to stop you know the predatory child removal you know through foster care agencies that monetize children disproportionately black children and indigenous children right and then did i miss a mother joyce mcmillan of course who um has created, you know, a very powerful intervention with, you know, J-Mac, you know, families in protection. And I've seen, you know, the clips where she's, you know, giving testimony like in Albany and trying to shift the laws from being less predatory and understanding that this has to be abolished, that CPS has to be abolished, right? So when I think of those four collective, I see all of these stages that we've talked about but also the dimensions from national to international, because literally um, we posted the round table, it's on Williams College, but it's also on Black Power Media. Don Wooten talks about genocide. Like if you take my womb from me, you've destroyed my productivity. Whether or not I wanted to have children was up to me, right? but you're going to threaten me with the loss of food or you're going to take my, you know, four-year-old who's over there and separate me from it. So you're going to force me into this erective. This is a form of genocide. And so we closed the book. Actually, I can hold up the book. It's like, hey, here's the book. Proceeds go to prison radio. We, um, we closed the book by talking about We Charge Genocide, the 1951 document that Paul Robeson and others brought to the UN. And it was organized by the Civil Rights Congress, which is a, a black segment of the Communist Party USA, right? And I believe Shirley Graham Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, um, William Patterson, obviously, um, Paul Robeson and others contributed to this declaration. And I think it's linked to what's going on today in Gaza, but that kind of linkage maybe hasn't been explored enough or sufficiently, right? So it's 1951, the Convention for the Prevention and Elimination of Genocide, I believe, um, was crafted around 1948. So definitely Google check things, right? Because my numbers are, all the, I'm not a historian, so you have to check the dates when I give you dates, right? But that's a ballpark. So what happened is that Black leftists are looking at the lynchings, the police killings, the, you know, pushing people off their land, the disappearances, the torture, right? 
And so they create a document that goes global. And you we can't contain the US, but we can shame it. And so it becomes like a, a call out blast. This is how genocide is inflicted on populations. And it doesn't have to look like the same genocide, right? In Nazi Germany. In fact, the Germans practice like on people in Namibia, the Herero, I believe, like before they turned that violence against um, Jews and Roma and LGBTQ folks and communists, right, in Germany. So in this statement, we're claiming whether or not the UN functions, and obviously it doesn't, right? Not do it, it doesn't do it. Well, we're claiming the right to call out a state for predatory violence that is structured and repetitive. And we're also calling that the entire global ethical yeah, citizenry, global citizenry that is not fascist, but anti-fascist, that they take a stance. Like if so, if we were doing this in 51 and we know about the Nakba in 1948 or the Balfour Agreement in 1917, whatever, you know, we all have long lineages of dispossession. I mean, think of the indigenous, you know, in the US and the Americas. We don't want a Tower of Babel. We speak different, you know, obviously different languages and dialects, but the intent of our meaning has to converge to a very clear point that genocide will not be allowed, that ethnic cleansing will not be allowed, that the theft of land will not be allowed, that the stealing or disappearance of children into prisons or into graves will not be allowed, right? And so I see our struggle from 1951 grappling with the international to this book trying to you know remember it for myself and whoever cares to remember with me and honor Erica Garner and more than Erica Garner there's a number of people in this book right Malcolm's here Martin's here we have to build we already have let me put it this way a common shared language but I would say we need to go back to the text of the radicals who risked everything to put that language in print. And, you know, and then got, you know, FBI tracking them. Everybody who signed that, of course, was harassed by the state. And W.B. Du Bois, remember, he popularized the notion of a black elite talented 10th in 1903 that came from white philanthropists, Henry Morehouse, Spelman and Laura Spellman, a Rockefeller. So Morehouse and Spellman are named after white philanthropists. We're all about the elites who would keep everybody else in line. But we need to go back to the radical text that called out an imperial state for its predatory violence and understand that the death on the street in the neighborhood is linked to the, death, the deaths around the globe. And that really is in our inheritance. This, we're heirs to that, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say. Go ahead and read all the academic books you want or you don't want to read. I don't, I mean, I just don't care. At this point, the people who actually knew and wrote clearly were the people who actually did the deed. Cabral, who's on your shirt, the Civil Rights Congress, Malcolm, Ella Baker, and you don't have to read them through the lens of an academic or a biographer, read them directly to what they said to the people. Read when they confront the state clearly. And they're not talking about non-reformist reforms. They're demanding a ceasefire and interstate predatory violence. And for me, that is the ultimate lesson of how to knit together an international language that can go beyond the Tower of Babel. But also, you know, be prepared for the repercussions. Like you, I mean, if you clearly call out the state, you know, journalists, not just in Gaza, but elsewhere disappear or are killed. Writers are imprisoned or disappeared. Again, if 
my four or five stages, there could be 50, I don't know, make your own stages, whatever the stages are of struggle and love, love inspired struggle, which does not make you weak. It makes you risk everything. So I mean, you could paraphrase Che at the risk of seeming ridiculous, right? I'm still going to abide by this. Our clarity would be that we cannot rehab the state. We have to confront its lack of ethics and its lack of care for life itself. The poisoned water, the poisoned land, the poisoned children, the disappeared, the incarcerated, the wards that they want to start shooting at people trying to find sanctuary from nations that we historically, the U.S., helped to destabilize through contras, through coups, through military training. So for me, Ryan, we're all going to need new bones. It's just like, who is your collective that you're going to knit them together with? Who Who's your Aspen Grove that you share one root line that is buried deep? That's why those trees are upright still because they're all connected on one long, tough underground line. That for me is a challenge, but it's like the also a most beautiful gift. Just as Erica Garner was a gift and the multiple people mentioned in this text that I'm paying homage to or honoring, um, we become gifts to each other as long as we're willing to struggle and to share that language of resistance that moves beyond these early stages and that resist all the prizes and the awards and the monetization of black death that corporations and nonprofit corp corporations are happy to shower upon us. Thank you. No, I, I could ask you questions for days about your book, but I, I do wanna be respectful of your time. Um, but is there anything else that we didn't discuss today that you wanna mention before we close? I would say, um, well, one, I want to thank you and your platform. And I would just reiterate if I wasn't clear before, this is really a collective endeavor. I mean, it was like me, like staying up way too late, trying to like pat, patchwork it together. I mean, I come from a family, you know, people from Mississippi who did patchwork quilts, like, you know, you take the colorful old rags and then you make art but it also keeps you warm. And so I would say that, you know, following this conversation, I feel more optimistic. I don't know what that means, but I remain realistic at what we face, but I do believe that we have the connections. And one last thing I would say is like, I know that often that we organize in silos politically. I'm, I'm, I think increasingly that we're gonna have to bridge in order to be stronger against a rising fascism. And so maybe as we keep our principles, we can let go of the rigidity and then we can open more doors to dialogue and seeing where we converge. And then if other people have moved to another source, then freely they're gonna to move to the other source. But if we can build that common root line of, a, of an Aspen and we can bury and go closer to the hypocenter of deep struggle, then we're more likely to stand upright rather than to be toppled. And I would, I hope I, this is the thing I like about me because I just say I'm like just a librarian. I'm just archiving, collecting data. So I'm not a leader of anything, right? And I do not have a brand. I don't care what people say. It's an analysis. This, those two are not the same thing. But I look forward to the growing organizations, interventions that see the connections and that reflect the determination that Erica Garner and others delivered upon. So we're broken, but we can be mended. 
we're minded, you know, people try to break us again, but we have the collective. And I would say, look for the books that, you know, you, you will still read academic books because like they're there, but look for the books that go against the dominant narrative. And I'm not talking about the reactionary, like the Moms of Liberty, which are now a joke, right? Because they're doing threesomes. Well, they're trying to ban everybody else, right? So obviously I'm not talking about fascist literature. But the, rev the revolutionary, the radical interventions have to be flexible. They can't be rigid. I know, you know, there's different intellectual leaders who made incredible contributions. But if we don't have a flexibility, if we can't bend, we're more likely to break. So look for the books that are coming out, the scholarship. I'm not saying don't read any academic books. I don't want to be on the record on that one. Because I also, I have two academic books coming out, like one next month, contextualizing Angela Davis. And it is not bashing Angela Davis or people who think that. It is a critique of how from the 1940s on, the state really engineered um, a program around assimilation and integration of schools and how certain families could levy into like these private white elite zones to socialize and raise their kids and they would garner these degrees, but that actually shaped the way in which political thought was being transferred. It was no longer like, you know, on the streets and somewhere or something, it was gonna be like in these private schools, which, you know, from the sector I know, you know, that's where I teach now and how that actually creates a kind of leadership, which still makes contributions, but they're gonna be contradictions so that the ground starts to disappear. The leadership on the ground becomes invited to the table rather than no, we are the table. Like our communities are the table where we rest, where we share food, where we share drink, where we share thought. And so I would just say be creative in your reading, which I'm trying to be, but go back to the source, go back to the original text, right? And then read them first and then interpret what we're saying as academics. And I don't mean like just the biographies, read the speeches, like Cabral's speeches are online. And that, when I read Cabral, I read and I feel love. And it's amazing, you know, I mean, he's he sacrificed his life, right? He's assassinated by the Portuguese. And based on the data I've seen, the CIA, the US was also, you know, and NATO assisted in that violence, right? To break a movement. So again, I think we have capacity, we should continue to study, but with more flexibility about how we would interact with each other and that we don't have to be authoritatively right about everything, but we do need to share a common root system that is buried deep. So thanks for your contributions to that, Ryan. Thank you. And, and you know, you helped connect us to Tanya Siddiqui in Texas, um, and we're, we're working on a webinar that should be coming out um, in January and February on Palestine, um, which, I'll send you the links. Um, I don't want to say too much because it's still in the works, mm -hmm. um, but thank you for making that connection. Um, well, I, I do want to again recommend everyone read, this is a, Dr. James's most recent book, New Bones, Abolition, Captive Maternal Agency and the Afterlife of Erica Gardner. It's a must, must read. Um, again, Dr. James, thank you so much for coming on the show and we hope to have you back again soon. Okay, thank you, stay well.